All right. Well, I don't want to steal PG's tagline, so let's jump into the message. How about that? So can we start, can I just share a, a personal story with you just to kind of kick things off here? So for those of you that, that don't know me that well, one thing I want you to know about me is that I grew up in church. From a very young age, I was in church. Week over week, I was at Sunday school learning about the Bible, learning Bible stories. I, I learned so much over, through those years, and I'm forever grateful for the investment the church made into my life. Uh, and, and I remember the stories that I learned in Sunday school, the, the great stories of the Old Testament, right? These heroes of the Bible who did amazing things and had amazing encounters with God. I, re I remember the stories of Jesus, right? This man who on, on Christmas, he came to earth born in a manger. He grew up. He did amazing things. I, I, I have these kind of pictures of uh, the, the Bible stories, the coloring sheets that I did in Sunday school class of Jesus multiplying the fish and the bread, Jesus healing the blind man, healing the lame man, right? Jesus showing compassion to people. And, and in my young memory, I also ha have these memories of the story of Jesus when he laid down his life on Easter. He, he died, was crucified, was resurrected, right? And in this amazing way, and he ascended into heaven. And, and my view of Jesus coming out of my younger years went something like this. Once upon a time, Jesus was born in a manger. He grew up, he did amazing things, he was murdered, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, the end. And that was it. That was my perception of Jesus. What happened to Jesus? I never stopped to think what happened next. Where did Jesus go? What is he doing now? Where is Jesus? Jesus became a character for me that was trapped between these two bookend events. He was born in a miraculous way. He died and resurrected in a miraculous way. He went to heaven. But then what? And because of the way that I viewed this Jesus, born, raised, ascended to heaven, Jesus became this kind of icon, this, this relic to be remembered. He was this person who felt distant from me, someone I couldn't really know. And so, so I grew up with a faith in a Savior who was a Savior of the past. And one thing you should know about the church that I grew up in, too, is that the church I grew up in placed this kind of heavy emphasis on behavior. And, and this it might, might sound like I'm bagging on my home church. I'm, I'm not. This was just the, the traditions that we were, we were raised in. There was this emphasis on the things that you did or the things that you didn't do that defined being a Christian, right? So don't drink, don't curse, don't smoke, don't dance. Don't go to that R-rated movie uh -uh, if you get caught, right? To follow Jesus meant to behave. And so this, this was my perception of Jesus. Is, is He died for me, so the least that I can do, right, is to behave, right? Get my act together. I'm forever grateful for that tradition, but it was just this flip-flopped, outside-in sort of faith, that if I behave, somehow God was going to be okay with it. So do you, do, you, do you see it? Do you see how the way that I view Jesus absolutely shaped and formed my faith? You see, the, the Jesus that I gave my heart and my life to as a young man was this Jesus that was this memory, this distant man of the past who did amazing things and who wanted me to behave right. It was these traditions imparted to me that shaped and formed. And, and just like many others, our perception of who Jesus is, who is this man? Who is this Savior? Who is this God that shapes and forms our faith? And that's what I want to talk about today. How has your image of Jesus shaped your beliefs and your faith? So this is what we're going to look at today. Who is Jesus? If we see Jesus for who he really is, we'll see that Jesus isn't locked in a cage 
on the, the black and white pages of a Bible. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, don't, don't, don't misquote me. I'm not saying the Bible isn't a great thing. I know Jesus because of the Bible. The Bible reveals Jesus to me and reveals Jesus to us. But the point of it isn't the Bible. The point of it is Jesus. From the Old Testament creation through all the, the, the stories of the Old Testament, they all pointed to Jesus. The New Testament Gospels tell us about the life and, and, and the ministry of Jesus, right? The epistles of the New Testament tell us about how we should act and be as a church, but it all points to Jesus. And even the book of Revelation is, is pointing us to a future day when all of creation will be redeemed under the authority of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Do you hear me? It's all about Jesus. Jesus isn't confined to the walls of history where we have to live a life where we're constantly looking back, trying to remember this great man. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the ruler and reigner of the universe alive and well today. Amen. Jesus saved and redeemed history. He saved and redeemed our present, and he is saving and redeeming our future, and we can trust him. So let's jump into the text. If you, if you have your Bible app or your Bible, you can turn here with me. We're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15 through verse 20. This is Paul admonishing the, the church in Colossia about Jesus. So let's read this together, beginning in verse 15. Paul says this. He says, Christ is the invisible, uh, let me start over again. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see, the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. This is Jesus we're talking about. Verse 17. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is the first in everything. Verse 19, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's Jesus. This is Paul's letter to the Colossian church. See, Paul had gone on several missionary journeys, and, and on his third missionary journey, he had made a pit stop in Colossia and had established and planted a church there. And now from prison, Paul is getting updates about how things are going in all these churches that he planted. And, and one of the updates that he got about the, this, this Colossian church had him a little bit troubled. And so he writes this letter to them to right a wrong that was happening in their midst. And he begins, if you go back and read the first few verses of, of chapter 1 of Colossians, Paul starts with some, some pleasantries, some greetings, but then he jumps right into it and starts swinging at them. And, and he comes at them with these big assertions about who Jesus is. And notice he's not talking about Jesus' miracles. He's not talking about his miraculous birth to a virgin. He doesn't mention a resurrection. He mentions the Jesus of now. Why is he doing this? Why did Paul jump right into these reminders? Well, what do you say we find out? You see, scholars believe that this letter was written somewhere between A.D. 50 and A.D. 60 in that time frame. And, and, and the church in Colossia, which was a Roman city, so it was a church of Gentiles. If you don't know what Gentiles are, like the Bible is primarily written by Jewish people. And so they define the world in kind of two different, uh, two different sectors. There was the Jews and the Gentiles. Either you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. And the Colossian church was a Gentile church made primarily of uh, people with a, coming from a Greek tradition. And, and word had reached Paul that there was some misinformation leaking into the church. And in fact, scholars call this the Colossian heresy. The Colossian heresy. And in, in, in fact, 
what we, we find is that the, the, the things that were happening in this church were things that we even struggle with today. You see, there were, there were false teachings that were seeping in and bubbling up inside the church that came from really from two primary places. The, the first was uh, uh, this form of Jewish legalism, right? So Jews who were trying to impose Jewish traditions onto Gentiles, right? So they were trying to assert that to be a Christian meant that you would hold to certain Jewish traditions. You, you'd be circumcised, circumcised. You would... Uh, you would follow certain eating practices. You would observe certain Jewish holidays, right? And so they were making it about the tradition rather than about the gospel. They were taking the traditions that they grew up on that were a part of who they were, and they wanted everyone else to follow them. Now, now before we get too judgy about these people, let's be careful <laughs> because we see this even today. People who bring their traditions, who bring the stuff from their past, and they want to drag it in and begin imposing it on other people. I grew up singing the hymns, so you better sing the hymns, right? I grew up not watching R-rated movies and not drinking, not smoking, etc. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. And if you're going to be a good Christian, you better follow the rules. We can be just like them. We can fall into these legalistic tendencies if... If, if, if we're not careful. And so the, this force of legalism was beginning to impose itself on, on the church. And it was becoming more about the stuff that people were doing. It was more about behavioral modification than it was about the gospel. And it was affecting the, the church. Now, there was, a, there was another thing that was happening <laughs> in their midst that was causing some ripples too and, and some heresy as well. And it was this idea of Greek mysticism. So go back and think about, you know, what you know about Greek mythology, right? So there are these people who came from this Greek mystical background, and they were beginning to drag these memories and traditions of Greek mysticism into the midst of the church. And it was beginning to infiltrate, and it was beginning to, to, uh, to cause shifts in the way that people were defining and seeing Jesus. And so, so people were creeping into the church teaching these false beliefs that were even denying the godship of, of Jesus, right? These polytheistic kind of beliefs that were saying, well, Jesus really wasn't God. He was an iteration or an intimation of God. He was a deity for sure, but not God himself. But Jesus created all things, and so a physical being can't create a physical world, so he has to be spiritual. And so this, this belief system was saying that Jesus wasn't God and he wasn't man. They were getting it wrong on every front, but they were just bringing their own traditions and beliefs into the mix, and it was really leading people astray. Now, now this, this heresy that was emerging out of the church in Colossia was really the beginnings and the roots of uh, a term that you might be familiar with, with, which was Gnosticism. Does that sound familiar to you? The Gnostic beliefs. You turn on Netflix, go to YouTube, you can, you can see these videos about the Gnostic Gospels, the Lost Gospels. That, that word Gnostic, the, the, the root word of it means knowledge or secret knowledge. The, the, the idea behind this was that if you just know the secret... If you just know the secret, if you know the secret information about God, it will unlock a connection with God. And, and again, let's be careful because we still see this today. Anyone know the secret, right? If you just know this bit of secret knowledge, if you just know the Bible code, right? <laughs> it's going to unlock this new revelation, this new information about God that's going to be a game changer for everyone. But let me tell you this, we don't need new revelation, we need Jesus, Amen. right? And the roots of this heresy continues on even today, we see it today, but, but it, it, it continued in the church for hundreds of years to this point in, in about A.D. 325, the church had to get together. They called it the Nicene Council. And they had to put a stake in the ground once and for all of who Jesus was because it was getting out of hand. And, and they coined this, they call it um, the Nicene Creed. And let me just read you one ex excerpt from it. 
It, it was the church trying to right the ship when it came to Jesus. And this is what they declared in, at the Nicene Council. They said, in, in one Lord Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, now listen to this, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. They were, they were taking it back to who Jesus was, Jesus God who became man, Jesus who was and is and is to come. And just like the Colossian church, it's important for us to know the real Jesus because it forms our faith. And so this is what I want to look at today. Five things that Paul points out about Jesus. And I want you to, if you're a note taker, take these things down, write them down. Five things that Paul writes to the Colossian church that he wants you to know and he wants us to know about who Jesus is. All right, number one, you ready for this? Jesus is the exact image of God. The revealer of the Father. Not like God, but the exact image image of God. If you want to know what God looks like, if you want to know what God acts like, look to Jesus. We know that God's a loving God. How do we know that God's a loving God? Well, we look at Jesus. We see him with a woman caught in adultery, which was a capital offense at the time, and Jesus covers her and tells the crowd, if you are without sin, you cast the first stone. And they walked away, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Don't sin anymore. He covered the sinner. Jesus with a woman at the well, speaking truth and life into her life. That's the loving Jesus. We know that God is love because we can look to Jesus and we see love. We know that God is the judge. How do we know this? Because we see Jesus. Jesus in the temple waging a protest, overturning tables because the church had turned the temple into a prophet center. And Jesus said, I won't have it. And he judged them and he overturned the tables. And we know that God is a judge because we can look at Jesus. You want to know what God's like? Look to Jesus. Now, for those of you who sit in your seat this morning and you're like, how can I know, Je how can I know God? Well, look to Jesus. Right. Dig into the gospels. What did he say? What did he do? And you want to know what God's like? Look at his life. Yeah. Paul said this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says it a little bit differently. He says, he is the express image of God, the exact representation of his being. You want to know God? Look to Jesus. Number two in verse 16, Paul asserts this. He says that Jesus is the creator of of all things. Through him and for him, creator of the world. In verse 16, he says this, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see, the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, and the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Are you familiar with Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That God is Jesus. He was there at the dawn of creation, the moment of creation. Jesus was there speaking into the darkness and creating the light. That's Jesus. On, on, on just this past week, I was out camping, doing some cold weather camping. I'm, Thursday night, I'm, I step out of the tent, and I look out into the night sky. It's just pitch black. And I just pause for a minute, and I look at the stars, just painting the sky and this bright moon. Looking at the cosmos, you know, uh, astronomers say that they believe that the universe is made of a billion, billion galaxies. I don't even know what that number means. <laughs> it's too big. And of those galaxies, there's a billion, billion stars in those galaxies. And for each of those stars, there are planets and moons rotating around them. It's like, I can't even take it all in how big the universe is. But Jesus was there creating it and speaking it into life. The prophet Isaiah said it this way. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured the heavens with his fingers? Who knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills 
on a scale, Jesus. Let me blow your mind. (laughs) Think about this. Jesus is the only person who ever lived before he was born. Whoa. (laughs) The creator of all things. That's Jesus. Number three, Jesus is the sustainer of the universe. He not only created the universe, he sustains the universe. He is the the, the thing that holds it all together. In verse 17, Paul says, he existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. That word hold is the same word that where we get the, the word cohesion, the stickiness of things, what holds it all together. Now, you remember high school chemistry when they talked about the atom, right? And I don't know, for some of you, this you might be like, Roger, you're nerdy, but... The atom, right? The atom are these, these, these tiny, I mean, these tiny particles, the stuff that makes the stuff, right? And what, what is an atom made of? It's made of these electrons that are negatively charged, spinning around a nucleus of positively charged particles. It's like when you try to push two magnets together and they won't go together, right? That's what's happening at these, these, these molecular levels, Right? And something is holding those things together so that it just doesn't all fly apart. Our universe is being held together. The cosmos is being held together by this stuff that we, we call gravity, right? The earth spinning around the sun. We, we see the effects of gravity. We don't know what gravity is. No, no scientist has ever been able to tell us what gravity is, but we see it from the, from the tiniest of the tiny to the biggest of the big. It's all being held together, cohered. By the one who sustains the universe. That's Jesus. Number four, Jesus is the head of his church, the body of Christ. In verse 18, Paul says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is the first in everything. Listen, we don't need to get together and vote. We don't need an advisory council to tell us that Jesus is the head of this church because he is. (laughs) The church was his idea. What we're doing right now is his idea, and he heads it up. It's his creative power. It's his motivation. It's his joy. We are not that big of a deal, but he is. It's all about him. And number five, Jesus is the fullness of God. Verse 19 and 20 say, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Everything that God wants us to know about who he is is found in Jesus. He is the fullness of all that we need to know about God. We don't need new revelation. We don't need new secrets. We don't need new information. We need Jesus. If you feel lost, if you feel stuck, look to Jesus. He's the author. He's the finisher. He's the alpha. He's the omega, the beginning and the end. That's Jesus. So in this world that presses from every side to insert its own traditions, its own beliefs, its own qualifications on how to be a disciple, how to be a follower of Jesus, We don't need something new. We need him. The image of God, the creator of all things, the sustainer of the universe, the head of his church, and the fullness of God, it is in him. It's all about him. And if we can just know the real Jesus, it centers our faith. It writes our faith. You know, the the, the mission of this church is to make more and better disciples. Disciples of who? Jesus. Because if we follow him, he's going to lead us in the right direction. He's going to take us to the right places. So here is my question for you. (laughs) This is for you. If Jesus can create all things, if he can sustain all things, don't you think he can sustain your life? In, in the places in your life that seem like dead ends right now, 
that seem like darkness right now? Don't you think that the creator of the universe can create a new path <laughs> where there is none? A new option for you if there is none, you can trust him. Where there seems to be nothing but just darkness and death, don't you think that Jesus can breathe new life into those spaces in your life? What are you, what are you facing right now? What's going on in your life? As we, as we face this new year, Maybe there's a lot of hope in your life. Maybe there's a lot of questions in your life. Look to Jesus. Do you believe that you can trust it to him? That's what being a disciple is all about. Is I will throw myself at your feet, Jesus, because you hold the keys to what I need in my life. And you can do it. So as we start this this new year, we're going to be walking through these 21 days of prayer and fasting. And it's all about him. It's all about him. I want to just take a moment here as we sing this closing song. And like we do every week, just make some space for the Holy Spirit to speak. And I, I'm convinced if you're like me, there's stuff in your life, right? Stuff in your life and you just can't muscle through it. You just can't press through it. You need the creator. <laughs> you need the sustainer. You need the head to throw yourself into and throw your trust into. So let's just take this moment and sing and put our focus on him. Would you stand with us as we sing this last song of worship together? Jesus at the center of it all. Oh, Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus at the center of it all. Oh, Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all from my heart. Oh, from my heart. It's all about you, yes, it's all about you, from my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center, it's all about you, yes, it's all about you. So Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess you Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus Jesus from my heart from my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's 
Can I pray for you this morning? So God, thank you for meeting us here. Lord, when I was little, I thought you were little. But you're so much more. When they placed that crown of thorns on your head, they thought I was torturing you, but little did they know it was the crown, the coronation, that you would be the King of kings and Lord of lords and alive and well, ruling and reigning over our lives, present, ever present in our lives. You are so big. Jesus, you are so big. Lord, and there's no problem in our lives that you can't handle. There's no obstacle that you can't make a way. So Lord, see my brothers and sisters this morning. Lord, you know what we need, and Jesus, would you be the center of it all? Put our focus on you. God, we need you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we close, if you would like prayer this morning, there'll be prayer teams at the end of service up front. Come and get some prayer. We would love to pray with you. But let me just... Pray the blessing over you before we leave and let's launch into this new year together. So Lord, would you bless them? Would you keep them? Would you make your face to shine down upon them and be gracious to them? Would you turn your countenance in their direction? Give them your peace in the almighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, we love you. We believe in you. We will fight for you. Have a happy new year.